A lot of you guys have been asking about the status of our 38 Special and 357 Magnum Ballistic Gelatin test. We are very close to having that wrapped up and I will be sure to let you know as soon as the results are ready. In the meantime, I wanted to give you a quick look at some of the background research that we did before we started the actual gelatin test. With 38 and especially with 357 Magnum, conventional wisdom says that barrel length has a huge bearing on the effectiveness of the bullet. The longer the barrel, the greater the velocity. For self-defense rounds, a higher velocity often translates to better penetration and better expansion. The same could be said for the semi-auto calibers that we've tested in the past, but 38 and 357 cover a much broader range of velocities than any one semi-auto caliber, and that means that barrel length tends to be an even more important factor with revolvers. So for our ballistic gelatin tests, we wanted to test each load with both of the two most common barrel lengths for defensive revolvers, which are two inch and four inch. But deciding which guns to use for the test was a little tricky because, for example, not all two inch snub nose revolvers are actually two inches. Some of them are one and seven eighths, some are two and a quarter inches or two and one eighth, and we weren't quite sure how much of a difference it would make in our test results if we chose one snub nose over another. We also wanted to verify that there was a significant difference in velocity between the two inch and four inch barrels that we wanted to use for our test before we started shooting up a bunch of expensive gel blocks. So we got out the chronograph and measured velocity for a few different loads that we just happened to have in the safe. Uh, four of them were 38s and four 357s. We ended up testing those through a lot more guns than we had originally planned. A couple of them weren't available for some of the Magnum loads that we tested, but in total we got velocities from 10 revolvers and just for fun I also brought along the carbine. We fired five rounds of each load through each gun and took the average velocity. The full results are posted on our blog in an exciting spreadsheet format, but what I actually wanted to show you is better represented by this graph. Each line here represents one of the loads we tested. There is another piece of conventional wisdom that says every time you add an inch to the barrel length, you should get a velocity increase of about 50 feet per second. Now that might be a generally decent rule of thumb, but obviously that's not absolutely true or each line on this chart would be continually increasing from left to right. Here's a look at just the 38 special loads. The velocity does generally increase with barrel length, but not at any kind of predictable rate. In a few cases, the velocity actually drops going from a shorter to a longer barrel. The biggest drop was with the Smith & Wesson Model 28, which took a huge nosedive in velocity with the two jacketed bullets compared to the three inch and the other two four inch barrels. It's not a surprise that the carbine by far had the highest velocities, but going from the four inch barrels to the six inch Taurus, there is not as much of an increase as you might expect. There are some similar things going on with the Magnum loads. The four inch Model 28 is not showing much better velocities than the three inch Model 66. We didn't have the 640 or the 686 available for all of these, but you can see with both the Winchester and the Magtech loads, the 686 is also slower than the other three and four inch barrels. Obviously, this is a very small sample size for both the ammo and the guns we tested, so take these results with a grain of salt, but I think there are a few things we can learn here. First, there are a lot of factors influencing velocity besides just barrel length. For example, the Model 28 we used was made in the 1970s, and the 686 is from the 80s. All the other revolvers we tested are fairly new. It could be that those older revolvers were made to be optimized for loads that we just didn't happen to test. Maybe they have a different rifling twist rate or a wider cylinder gap, or maybe the chambers aren't as tight. The six inch Taurus revolver has a ported barrel, which might account for its fairly unimpressive velocities. The bottom line here is that when you're looking at barrels that are very close in length, you can't make any assumptions about velocity until you actually measure it. I also think it's safe to say that when you're looking at modern snub nose barrels around two inches, there is not likely to be a huge difference in velocity. We ultimately chose to use the two inch Kimber K6S for the actual ballistic gelatin test because it's got a steel frame, so firing the Magnum loads is a little more tolerable than a lightweight gun. The Kimber also showed pretty middle of the road velocities compared to the other short barrels. 
For the 4 inch test gun, we went with the Ruger GP100. Now it's technically a little longer than 4 inches, 4.2 makes it legal to own in Canada, but it's one of the most popular 4 inch revolvers on the market, and the velocities we measured with it didn't show any unusual outliers. If this kind of nerdy velocity stuff gets you excited, definitely check out ballisticsbytheinch.com. Those guys have done basically the same thing that we've done here, but they've got results for just about every handgun caliber and barrel length you can think of. If you wanna know whether any of this velocity stuff has any real impact on self-defense bullet effectiveness, be sure to subscribe so you can find out when we post our ballistic gel test results. As always, you can support this channel and any of our other projects by getting your ammo from luckygunner.com.